No mai hari mai. Uh, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Um, it's my great pleasure to welcome everybody here tonight for the inaugural lecture for Professor Stephen Marshall, um, who is the uh, Director of the Centre for Academic Development here at Te Hedunga Waka. Uh, my name is Nick Smith and I'm the Vice-Chancellor here. <clears throat> and I'm really excited to hear Stephen's lecture for probably three interrelated reasons. Um, the first is that he's going to talk to us about the future of the university and where that sits in the changing socio-political and increasingly financial contexts. And I think there's a lot to learn in that process. The second is a sort of enlightened self-interest. And that in the university community, we have enormous expertise across a whole range of different uh, specialties, but we don't always listen to our own expertise around things that are relevant to us. And just from an enlightened self-interest perspective, I'm really interested to hear what Stephen has to say. And the third, <clears throat> which I've learned from reading my notes, is that we're going to listen to a Renaissance man. We're going to listen to somebody who uh, has been at this university uh, for many years, back to the mid-90s, um, when he received his PhD in biochemistry. Um, he then went and worked in information technology in the university and then has, has evolved into the Centre for the academic, academic Development, which is at that cutting edge of where technology and learning um, are creating what is a unique experience for our students. And I think it's, a, it's an experience which is probably more important than it has ever been. It's an experience which is increasingly relevant, and it's an experience which I'm very much looking forward to learning about uh, more in the next hour. Uh, congratulations, Stephen. We're delighted to welcome you once again to the Professoriate of the University, and I'm very much looking forward to your lecture. How's that? All right, thanks, Bondi. Bondi's been here throughout my entire time at this university, keeping me in check, so thank you. It's lovely to be here and to take this opportunity to talk about my research with, with friends, with family, with the wider community of the university. Uh, and uh, this is going to capture something of the, the life that I've had at this university that Nick mentioned. Uh, but I'm primarily going to be thinking about what that might help us understand for the future of, of universities in general. Um, but I do want to start with a sort of caveat. I, I spoke previously to Grant Guilford uh, a year or two ago, and I asked him when the professorial infallibility thing kicked in and, and gave me that protection. And it turns out, when you stop laughing at me, uh, that it doesn't. So uh, I, will, I will, however make some mistakes. I will tell you things that are going to be wrong. Uh, hopefully they're going to be thought provoking though, and wrong in an interesting way. And one of the things I really want to emphasize is that when we think about the future, when we engage in futures research, the type that I'm going to talk about today, we are not trying to predict the future. We're trying to understand the dynamics of things that affect us in order to allow ourselves to learn and prepare for a range of different futures we might experience. So it's not about setting a predictable 100% pathway, it's, it's understanding the variety of pathways. I'm also just gonna talk primarily about things that have happened in the past for me because I'm much more confident that those actually did happen. So that's, that's gonna work for us. I do also have to make a couple of other disclaimers. Um, first of all, I'm not really gonna be talking specifically tonight about the key decisions facing Victoria as an institution and, and as an organisation. I'm talking about universities in a, in a bigger sense. Um, I have colleagues who are much more responsible for what actually happens in this university and I'll provoke and stimulate them and, and you in our, in our audience. But I do want to be really clear, I'm not trying to define Victoria's future in this talk at all. I'm also not going to talk about the role of the university as a research institution. Um, that's an entire separate conversation that has to happen and is an important part of that. It's another reason why you shouldn't take what I'm saying today as a defining, framing thing for this particular university. It's complex and many faceted. Uh, but it turns out that the learning and teaching role that we play in the positioning of ourselves in, in society in general are still pretty important things to consider. So, um, more things that I'm not going to talk about include some of the drivers for the challenges facing the university. 
there's a talk there and we'll be able to get that URL and go and watch the one I gave last year. I'm not doing that talk again because it's a really depressing talk. This one's meant to be much happier and positive and future looking. Um, I also can't not put in an ad for my book where 500,000 words providing all of the background evidence for a number of the statements I might make either in that video or, or tonight. Uh, so I'm also not going to talk very much about COVID, believe it or not. There's a couple of things where it's going to pop into the talk because it's a bit hard not to. But the things I'm talking about tonight are much bigger than one single event. As, as dramatic as that might be, things I'm talking about tonight are playing out over decades and generations. I'm also not going to talk very much about AI <laughs> for a bunch of reasons. Um, it's an important part of what's happening to the university, but again, not actually, I think, part of the fundamental driver for where we're going as an organisation and, and as an institution of society. It's a thing, it's a technology, it's an important tool, but I think there are bigger and more important things to talk about. So. Here's the proposition I'm going to put in front of you. The proposition is that what we are experiencing as universities, as societies, is a generational shift, not merely a little bit like last year, but a bit more so. I think we are at the cusp of some fairly significant systemic changes affecting higher education globally. And it's not just in New Zealand. We're seeing these things in many different countries. Also, though, when we talk about universities in different ways. So we talk about the entrepreneurial university. Uh, there are other models of university with organisations talking about them as ecologies and so on. Those are about looking inwards at the university. I want to look outwards. I want to look at what at the boundary between the university and society at large. And I want to think about the system of the universities in, in, in large scale, not simply inside one institution. And looking at that, I want to ask, what does that look like as an institution of our society operating at a very large scale, universally experienced, but for our common good, not for merely economic good, although the two are related. And the phrasing I'm using here very much as an institution, as a social institution, which is to say something which is fundamental to the operation of our society. So we talk about having uh, structures of law, uh, of, of the way that we relate to each other, uh, parliament, etc. Universities are part of modern, well-functioning societies operating for the good of the population. And that's the institution that I'm passionate about protecting, why I've been here for so long not just about this one place, it's about the role that it plays and the role that I think many of us share in, in valuing that and making that happen. So I'm going to do a little bit of uh, talking about uh, some of the models that underpin this and then I'm going to kick into the main part of it. A, a critical one is something that a sociologist called Martin Trowe came up with in the 1970s when he looked at the university systems in the United Kingdom and compared them to the United States. And he noticed that a fundamental driver changing the natures of those universities was the scale in which they operated in society. When they were institutions that only met the needs of a small proportion of the population, the elite, now that could be intellectual, social, economic elite, all sorts of different types, universities sit somewhat disconnected from society. They are their own thing, they're important for the people who are part of it, but they're not necessarily that important for people who are not part of that environment. However, when they grow to be, get large enough, the nature of the university shifts. They become much more part of the fabric and functioning of society. And Martin Trow observed that that led to changes in how they operate. Because as something lifted its scale and impact into society, he observed that things like the government's behaviour around its regulations, how it's funded, how the, the drivers for what is valued and seen as important, shift. And then finally he observed that there was, hypothetically at that time, an opportunity to see another shift. And he predicted what might happen when it grew to such a sufficient scale 
that the university was a normalized experience in everyone's life and that that might see it shift again. So those three models, elite, its focus is primarily about legitimizing someone. It's access and privilege. That is what is reinforced primarily in that model. The mass model is about the creation of a qualification, certification framework, economic utility, and often and commonly the creation and sustaining a meritocracy. The problem with meritocracies is that not everybody has the same experience moving up the ladder of success. So meritocracies hypothetically seem like a good thing as they grow, but as the scale of a meritocracy grows, people start to recognise the fact that it also uh, leads to an ongoing sustaining of inequality. People don't start at the same point on the ladder. The steps that they might move on that ladder are often very differently separated. When we move into the universal space, the focus shifts away from the systems that have been established in the mass model and leads you to a model which is much more about the individual personal experience of education, of an intellectual life, and its value to yourself, but also then to the common experience of that because it's something that we all share and experience. So potentially there's an opportunity to move away from some of the drivers of inequality, although there are no easy solutions. Another way of thinking about that framework is to think of it as a series of layers and interfaces. So in the elite model, the interface is between an individual learner and their university. It's a very limited scale interface. When we move into the mass model, the university operates within a system and it starts to become part of the fabric of society. So there is an intersection between the individual university and the institution of the university in that society, the system of higher education. Finally, when we move into the universal model, the focus shifts to consider the relationship between that social institution and the wider society and community, and within that, the individual learners and communities within that. And that's where I'm going to spend most of my time for the rest of this talk, is thinking about what it looks like when our universities start moving into that space and, and what the implications might be. Now, I'm going to refer to a bunch of research at different points in this, and that text, which is almost probably too small for most of you, comes from a, a, a piece of work that I did to think about how to ask questions of a piece of work in a way that considers uh, how we make sense of what's happening. So rather than trying to measure something simply for accountability reasons, the framework that I have and, and cited there is around asking questions that help you challenge your understanding of that thing and unpacking it. I'm going to focus primarily, though, on one of those questions in relation to, to the focus for tonight, which is, what is it that we can do as a society, as a community, as a university, uh, as individuals, to promote this concept of achieving a common good through a universal experience of higher education rather than simply a, a mass credential one? I'm going to do that by sh taking you through sort of three general areas. I'm going to talk a little bit about change, which is always an entertaining conversation in higher ed. I'm going to talk a little bit about technology, because I can't not talk about technology. Um, and then I'm going to come back and, and sort of summarise and look at, at the common good and what that might look like for, in universal higher education. Um, I'm going to do that based on some drawing some connections to experiences that I've had here at this university. So you can see me in my first career as a biochemist uh, looking at the DNA of a bunch of different people. In fact, that's the gene for alcohol dehydrogenase I'm looking at right there. Um, and I'm pointing at the genetic variant that protects some people from becoming alcoholics. It's also the point at which I started writing software because it's very hard to check that you've actually transcribed those sequences correctly uh, while checking a, a written version and, and this uh, version there. So I actually wrote some software to read DNA sequences out to me. And it was the start of my technology career. 
but I'll, I'll draw on some of these other parts of my life experience to unpack some of the rest of this tonight. But yes, it has been a long and varied career. So these are some of my favourite words that colleagues will, will, will well recognise. These are all synonyms for a much more important word, change. When people talk to you about innovation, when they talk to you about transformation or disruption, they're trying to talk about change and trying to do it in a way to, to frame that conversation up. I'm just going to talk about change because change is experienced in many and myriad different ways. And often it's the very ordinary experience of change that's far more important to us and far more likely to have a wider impact on society than massive transformational change, often a distraction. Now, you can't really talk about change in higher education and universities without referencing Clark Kerr and, and his observations on the university. This is a very common quote. Uh, and People often point to images like the one on the right there of, of a, a lecture theatre experience. I particularly like the student in the second row in the foreground who's fallen asleep. Uh, nobody's done that yet here, but it's fine. Um, and, and the reason I quite like this quote is because it's pretty much wrong in many important ways. And, and one of the things that this quote really doesn't unpack and pay attention to is that this, the universities we're experiencing today are completely different to the ones of a generation ago. The superficial parts of them, the buildings and so forth, old-fashioned robes, yes, those things we carry with us because it's always an and, not an or. But this is a different university. And if you look back, and there's a guy called Geiger who has done this, and, and unpack 10 generations of the evolution of the American university system as it responds to the different environments, the different needs of society that it's operating within. And so one of the things that we need to get better at in universities is recognising and harnessing that, that generational change. Uh, and unfortunately, as much as we would like to to do that, universities are not as good as some organisations. This is from a very well-regarded model of, of large organisational change. Um, and the insight that this image represents is this idea that in any environment, there are things that you must retain. The core, the identity, the values, the things that define what it is that makes the work of your organisation meaningful. However, you also have to do things which stimulate that to grow and to change and to evolve. And it's very easy to mistake physical affordances, the major things that are in your face, as being the core, and to not recognise that there's something beyond those, which is, in fact, the real value of the university, which I, and I'll come back and talk about what I think that is a bit later on. The problem we have in universities, and that I've experienced many times in my career here, universities just think we're about protecting the core. The university is eternal and timeless, and our behaviours need to move on from that. And if we don't, if we're not part of that, then we will suffer, because it is going to keep happening despite us. And, and part of the reason for that, I did say I wasn't going to talk about um, COVID particularly, because COVID is actually only merely the latest in a long sequence of crises. Um, we've now even got the word permacrisis to help us understand the fact that our environment is not sufficiently stable that we can remain in that preserved status that we ha have had in the past. So I did say I was going to draw on some of the history of, of my work at the university. And, and this fine fellow is the New Zealand Fear or the Blue Duck, resident of, of many alpine uh, catchments in New Zealand, uh, renowned for keeping trampers up at night with, with their whistling call. Um, the thing about blue duck is it turns out they are very much home-loving birds. They're a bit like me. I came to the university. I said, I like it and I'm staying. That is the blue duck model of life. Where, where they get raised by their parents, that's where they're going to live to the extent where we did DNA fingerprinting on blue ducks. And 
if you were, if that was a human DNA fingerprint on the, on the right there, that would suggest some serious issues in the family because it's a very highly inbred DNA sequence. You can see that all of the bands in the individual columns are related. Basically, the, the, there are very, very few bands that are not shared by different individuals. And that's because blue ducks are raised by their parents, they set up home immediately next door, and they breed and interbreed with very close relatives. And they have done so for thousands and thousands of years. And they're perfectly healthy and perfectly happy like that. If you take them away from their catchment, they fly home, because that's where they live. So the bad news about this research, which I published with uh, Sue Triggs and, and my PhD supervisor, Jeff Chambers, um, you can't build dams on the rivers and the ducks will just move. So we were unpopular with the electricity generators pointing out that if they did build a dam in, in these large alpine catchments, then they were going to wipe out a, a portion of the genetic diversity of these ducks. So that's an example of an animal that's doing fine as long as nobody builds a dam, as long as the environment it's in remains stable and static. Unfortunately, New Zealand ecologically has demonstrated that stability is not a thing that you can depend on for universities or for ducks. Um, sadly, this, is, well, given that they're un unkindly called rats with wings, this is an example of an animal that's doing much better in the sort of disrupted and disturbed environments uh, that universities and, and animals are experiencing these days. And, and I, I, Oscar Wilde called them rats with wings. That's a bit unkind. Pigeons are actually incredibly smart animals. They're very, very good flyers. They're incredibly adaptable to a different environment, as, as anyone who tries to keep them from destroying the buildings by building nests all the way through them knows. They're very, very good at getting what they want out of life. So pigeon, as much as it's maligned, or, or eaten in some places, um, is a very successful animal because of its ability to take what it can find and make the best use of it and not overcommit itself to one particular way of living its life. Now, the good news is there are lots and lots of different pigeons. So I want, the argument I'm saying here is not that we have to become very generically re reactive to whatever we find on the day, but it is possible for us to have our own identity, to be special and different in our own way, and yet still be able to do that agile thinking, that, that looking for the changes that are and the opportunities that are there for us. And of course, there are new and interesting ways that we can bring pigeons together. Thank you, OpenAI, uh, for my cyborg pigeon image. So I now want to shift from talking about change and, and the reality that we must change and be responsive to it to talking about technology. What do you see in this picture? Tell me a story. What do you see? Lots of devices. Yep. I actually took mine off and gave it to my wife. It's the first time in many years I'm not actually walking around with a phone in my pocket. Yes. What else, Betty? Paul? Yeah. Absolutely. There's, there are lots of ways this can be interpreted. I've heard someone talking about the fact that you take kids to wonderful museums and all they do is talk on their damn phones. There's an equally valid narrative that says you take them to the museum, they get really excited about what they're seeing and they use their device to share that and to learn more about it and to, to use that tool to lift the experience that they're having. And that's the argument that I want to make in terms of how we think about the role that technology plays in what we do. It's not something else, it's part of the experience. In fact, we've, we've captured this at this university and this diagram's turned up in our various strategies around learning and teaching, this idea that we embed a whole range of different technologies into different contexts within the experience. So in a room like this, a formally scheduled event, there's a bunch of technology present that's helping us do what we're doing today. There's a network. We could be using interactive tools to engage with each other. I could get you to bring out your cell phones and we could do some work with Go Soapbox. Uh, and be interactive. I'm not going to do that for time reasons, but we could have. Um, as we move out of that space, 
around it. There are a number of spaces we provide on this campus for students to keep learning with each other. So a whole bunch of shared rooms and spaces in different parts of the university. Beyond that, we provide other spaces, the mud eye, the library, student learning spaces, individual places to look after their learning. And then beyond that, our spaces turn into things which help us intersect out to the wider community. And we start having the boundary, as we're doing tonight, between the intellectual life of the university and our intersection with the, the wider community around us. However, let's talk about another view of some of the spaces we have. And I use this occasionally when I'm giving workshops on how to make lectures interesting and engaging. It comes from Michel Foucault. It's a, a lithograph. One of the reasons I like it is the guy at the front is lecturing people on the evils of alcoholism. Alcohol was one of the areas of my research uh, originally. But I'm particularly struck by the guard on the front there at the right, who's just really not having a good time. Um, I've actually been in one of these. There's a, one of them in Tasmania in the prison there. Uh, you can sit in it. It's called a uh, silent prison facility. The prisoners were not allowed to talk to each other. They were only ever allowed to talk to people who were good and would give them the correct view of the world. They were not to be contaminated by the views of the other prisoners around them. And there's an argument that says that sometimes a lecture can feel a bit like the guy at the front's telling you this is how the world has to be. And how dare you even think about talking to the people around you because the real truth's up here. Professorial infallibility for the win. But there are other ways we can do things. And this is from some work uh, some colleagues here did. Uh, I'm not sure if Amanda's hiding somewhere in the room. Ah, uh, there she is, hiding right in the back row. Uh, Kevin Gould and some other colleagues. So this is an example of what happens when we allow our, our students to talk to each other. Anyone who's done microscopy teaching knows the real problem with using a microscope is that you look in the microscope and you can see what you, the student thinks to see. You then get the student to look at it and they talk about the air bubble in the top right corner of the view because they don't know what they're looking at and you can't tell them where to look because only one of you can use the microscope at the same time. What they've done here is hook the microscope up to a big screen now they're all looking at what the microscope is showing at the same time, and everyone can talk about it and point at it and start drawing on the image and capturing what's going on there. And the microscope experience suddenly becomes a collaborative learning experience. Interesting observation, when they started doing this in the labs that use microscopes, they ran out of stuff to do in the lab about two thirds of the way through. The students were able to learn and do the work of the lab so much more rapidly that they didn't need the same amount of time previously. There's another layer to this though. You slap zoom onto this computer and suddenly you can be doing this with a classroom full of kids down on the South Island at the same time. So that collaboration is not bounded by the space of the university. When we start thinking about that, we're starting to think about the experience of learning in quite a different way to the one that was constrained by how many microscopes could we fit into the room? How many students could we look after in that model? Very, very powerful. So that's one way to think about technology. Second way to think about technology that came out of my IT career is that I started spending some time with people trying to work out why every large software project by anybody fails. And basically large projects fail. There was an interview on national radio this week talking about the fact that the success rate for very large projects is less than 1% for across doing what it's supposed to do, doing it in the time it's supposed to do, and doing it for the cost it was supposed to do. They all fail. Capability maturity model was invented as a tool to help the people who engage in large, complex software projects particularly think about what they did in a way to help them get better at doing that. And when I was looking at helping the university try to change rather than just preserve what it was doing and try to enact new projects, it struck me that this might be a way of helping people think about the capability of the university to bring technology to bear, to deploy the sorts of things like that microscope uh, example. And I created a thing called the e-learning maturity model, which has been very, very successful as, as a 
piece of research. And what it suggests is, is that being successful at complex work, being successful at changing, required paying attention to the doing of the thing, how you planned it, how you thought about the scale and scope and qualities of the thing that you were trying to achieve, how you framed it, how you managed the things that took place to make sure that you knew what you were doing and did more of the good stuff, and then optimising it. How did you think about how to improve that such that over time you just got better at what you were doing? And it struck me that actually you have to do all five of those. You can't, it's not a sequence. Uh, the original capability maturity model makes you go through a series of steps. I started thinking, no, actually, let's think about this holistically. Let's come up from lots of directions simultaneously. And a ton of stuff published on this, but the one insight that came out from a really big study we did of all of the New Zealand uh, polytechnics was that if we assessed their capability to engage in the use of technology for learning and teaching, and if we organised the resulting uh, thing, basically darker is better than light, is the simpler way to understand these blue dots. You'll notice that on the right-hand side, it's generally a lot darker than on the left-hand side. That was not due to the amount of money being spent by those institutions. It was not due to the size of the institution in terms of the number of staff. It came down to how clearly they could say what it is they were trying to achieve by engaging with technology and, and learning. And the investment in the people that they made in order to implement that strategy. So it, it was that investment in people to transfer, translate an idea, a technology, a strategy, a, an objective into reality that really drove a lift in the capability of the organisations. Uh, and that, that turned out to be a reasonably robust finding in, in a number of different contexts. So, how to enact that type of shift in a university. I'm going to take a step back to my early days working in IT at Victoria. On the left here, we have one of our first web pages for a course, dated 2002. Nate Talkington had finally talked to the university colleagues, Michael Newbury is here from IPS days, um, into this newfangled web thing, and we thought we'd give it a crack. So the thing about that web page is I wrote that by hand. Each and individual, each individual course that had a website, we had to hand code the web page. We couldn't restrict who had access to it because restricting access to people who were actually enrolled in the course was too hard to do. So you just you had a web page and that was it. Make 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 the best of it. Uh, of course, these days we now have MOOCU, which is the project that a number of my team who are present today would have been part of bringing to the university and, and delivering. And the thing to appreciate about this is that it's more than just making that web page happen. There is so much more happening in this image on the right compared to the image on the left that respects our development and our maturity as an organisation, our understanding that it's not just about delivering the web page, that it's about having standards threshold standards for, for what it is that that represents, that it have uh, ways that we can manage and measure what's happening in there, that it's standards driven so that we can continue to build and expand on it, and that it's something that we can continue to improve. So we went from something at Victoria which was designed around this idea of just managing access to web pages. So as I said before, that manual web page uh, was quite hard to restrict to just the people who should have access to it. That was Blackboard. Shortly after that manually created page came into being, we started having Blackboard, and, and it did us well for 20 years. And then we thought, maybe we should do better than that, and that's what we've been doing for the last couple of years, and we'll continue to do this year with what we're calling a learning platform. And, and just the difference in, in what you're seeing there represents a, a different way of thinking about what we're trying to provide. It's not just a tool that manages and curates a set of resources. It's a tool that provides experiences around discussion, inquiry, practice, production, acquisition, and collaboration, and that there is a diverse 
range of tools in that space and that we can change and iterate those tools independently of the core. The core enables that to take place, but all those other tools can be changed rapidly in order to be responsive. So we're keeping the core, we're preserving the things that are important, we're starting to discover how we can make some of those rapid changes to respond to the world. So that's where we are now. Now you'll notice there's some space on the right hand side, so surprise, surprise. Uh, beyond that, we're starting to think about what it means to go beyond that core platform and that looking inward to the university view of the world and start looking at what happens at the boundary as we look outwards from the university. So there are a bunch of tools that are starting to be used that are not in that core platform, but form an opportunity to go out into the world and to see things beyond that. And one of the ways to think about the opportunity that represents is, um, is, is this image, which I love, which is this idea that things can happen out in that space without carrying all of the encumbrances of the older model. I mean, this is, I find this just an astonishingly powerful image when you actually understand what has to be in place for that tablet to work well for those children, but also the opportunities it represents and the fact that it's an unencumbered experience that, that potentially can be available to everybody, including little kids on the top of water buffaloes. So how do we, as universities, move into that space. Let's talk about the universal models. And I want to start by acknowledging some work that I did with my colleague Catherine, who I saw hiding in the back also. Uh, and we just published this in, in the Oxford University Press, looking at the New Zealand education system and assessing it as it is currently. And if we keep our frame in the operations of the mass model, where it would sit, where you would say we are situated by our size, there seem to be really only roughly three choices facing New Zealand higher ed. One is we just let the market model operate. New Zealand's a very neoliberal country. We love market forces operating. We just let that happen. What will happen is that eventually some of the universities will break. That The nature of the environment we're in is that that unfortunately seems inevitable if we maintain a purely profit market oriented model of operating. So that's a problem. We could do what the government is trying to do with Te Pukenga with the Polytechnic and say, oh no, we'll just turn you all into one big coordinated uh, system uh, operating as a structured network. And, and this was done in California. It has been highly successful in California. It is now being dismantled because they can't afford to pay for it. So that's a problem. That's a generational problem that they're experiencing. Um, also, frankly, sitting on the bleachers looking at Te Pukenga, yeah, I'm not in a hurry to see them apply that model to the universities, and I don't think anyone else is now. The complexity and the challenge of actually trying to make that happen for real is, is really a problem. Or somebody finds the magic money tree, and we let ourselves just keep doing what we want to do. So none of these choices are great choices. The good news is there is an opportunity to think about ourselves taking that universal lens and to see other opportunities ahead and to grow into those. And those allow us to potentially manage some of the tangled complications of the previous models, but also to do what was given as the vision of the university in New Zealand more than 100 years ago, an opportunity for it to be something that is genuinely experienced uh, by everyone in New Zealand. And the thing to understand about that too, under a universal model, is it's not just the mass model delivered to more people. That is the mistake that you can make in thinking about that that leads you to things like MOOCs. We need to start when we think about universal models of higher education by asking ourselves, what is it that we are trying to do for our society? How is this thing a good thing for all of us? And how do we make that happen? So I used this image in the invitation. It's on the front slide. It comes from our COVID close down period. It's a bit stark. Those of us who love and work in this campus, that image can be a bit sad actually, looking at those empty halls. What we learned though from that experience um, 
is something that uh, Peter Fleming and Sydney expressed, um, unfortunately badly, um, the importance of people in giving the university its, its heart and its impact. So the university isn't those empty halls. It's the life that fills them. And it's the, the success of the university as a universal model is when we translate that life out into society at large. And so it's how do we make ourselves better at doing those things that, that I would like to finish talking about tonight. And I showed you this image before in terms of how we're thinking about how we situate the supports into learning and teaching. We can flip the onion. We can invert it and go into it and start asking ourselves, if we looked at the heart of this being how do we enable learning to be embedded into the community, into individual lives, and if that's our primary starting point and focus, the other things around the edges keep happening. This is not an either-or situation. This is an and. But shifting your focus to look into it that way changes how you challenge what it is that we do and why we think about it. Some of these ideas have been around for a while, I had to, in fact, they've been around for so long that I had to cross out the sexist language and open it up to the entire community. Um, the thing about mass education is it is so wound up with management of qualifications and accountability for qualifications. And we, keep, we do need them. The bachelor's degree is probably the most important thing you can get in your life if you have any aspiration to move around the world, because it is the thing that lets you into most other countries easily as a younger person. It is a thing that is widely recognized as being a, a proxy for, this is a good person to consider having a, an engagement with. The problem is that understanding is no longer as well accepted as it has been. And so, I want you to draw your attention to one particular part of this graph, which is the widening between the dark green line, which is the number of domestic students in New Zealand tertiary education, and the blue and the yellow lines, which are the population of people who, in theory, should be attending said education. That has been widening for 20 years. This is not a COVID phenomenon. This is a structural phenomenon of people recognising that the system is not necessarily working for them in delivering what they need in their life. This is, and if I come back to the, the elite mass and universal thing, the argument has always been that the systems will grow and grow and grow. And there are OECD charts showing every country in the world with an upwards trajectory of people getting educated. What those graphs are now showing in some countries is that line levelling off and going backwards. And what is happening, I believe, I posit, in New Zealand, for example, we have roughly 35% of the adults have a bachelor's degree and stabilised at that. It's been that for about the last seven, eight years. We're not educating more of the population. We're holding our ground and going even a little bit backwards. We are being influenced by something that I think the Tro didn't appreciate when he originally did his model by looking at America and, and the UK and comparing them as isolated systems. Our world has become very connected and globalised, very interconnected. So we are starting to be influenced by the scale of education globally, not just the scale of education within our own society. And that, that is starting to influence people's expectations and behaviours in this country. And they're starting to ask questions about, is this delivering for me what I need in my life, or should I be doing something else? There are lots of drivers for that. Cost uh, is a primary driver in many countries. But beyond cost is the sense that the degree is no longer delivering, given the scale of its operation globally, the same value as it might have done in the past. And that's a challenge for us as we start thinking about what might operate to replace it in the universal scale. Because one of the things that happens, this is uh, a guy called Clayton Christensen talks about this in his theories of innovation, a thing called low-end disruption. Essentially, once somebody works out a way of delivering a universal experience that's meaningful in multiple spaces and contexts for different people, 
not only will that serve that greater population of people, it will push back down into the space that's been traditionally operated as the mass system. So that decline which is present in the graph, as alternatives become possible, will accelerate. And that is a challenge to us if we're not on the side of the graph doing the accelerating and, and participating in that. So I've been doing some work with, with a European group looking at what it is that people need and, and need to experience in terms of skills and knowledge to be successful in life and throughout their life uh, in this, this global future skills project. And as part of that thinking, uh, I started thinking about the difference between the model that operates under mass education, where we separate the experience of learning from the experience of its application. So those two things operate in different spaces in a mass model. Um, it's like a production line. You separate out the tasks and, and you get more efficiency that way. Problem is, production lines don't always provide the level of individual experience that we want to achieve. On the right-hand side, the universal model suggests that we need to integrate those things together such that the experience of learning is integrated into its application directly. This is not work-integrated learning. Work integrated learning is a plug in to a qualifications model under a mass system. This is being in spaces of life and in the community and experiencing the opportunities to learn and be supported in doing that. It's a mind shift that we need to start thinking about. Interestingly, and not, not surprisingly, Harvard's already there ahead of us. This comes from Harvard's global strategy document that was produced last year. Uh, and they talked about the need to adopt a new strategy in thinking about how they enacted learning and teaching. The importance that it build on what we have, because this is always an and argument. We will always have elite experiences, particularly the intellectually elite experiences. We'll always have the mass. There is a, very much a need for the transition into life and, and the bachelor's degree in, in pure utility terms. But beyond that, there is so much more. And that's what Harvard has recognized uh, and what I think we all need to start reflecting on and considering for the university as we think about where our future lies uh, as a system. I just want to leave you, leave you with a couple of thoughts. This one from Diane Oblinger, president of EDUCORS some years ago, talking about how important it is to keep learning. And, and this is the small point at which I'll bring out AI and the potential that rapid technological change provides to us, which is the world is going to continue to accelerate in the scope and the extent of the change that we experience. We are somewhere at an inflection point, probably at an early point. We're not going to suddenly have general purpose AIs next year. But there are people who are not betting on us having them any time soon, who are now saying that yeah, maybe five years. Not very far away at all. And probably sooner than anyone's comfortable with, particularly based on our experiences so far this year. Second point, and the value of a university, we create the future, potentially. That's the thing about the people of this university and its intellectual heart and its strengths. We have the opportunity to define this by creating it. And if we're participating in its creation, if we're engaged with it, if we're learning about it and participating in it as actively as we can, we're much more likely to understand it and to be able to help other people understand it as well, which is one of our key roles uh, in supporting the social s structure of this country and our role as a social institution. Thank you very much. Tēnā tātou katoa. Ko Wendy Lana toko ingo, kei te tumu maru aia au. I'm the provost here at Te Haringa Waka. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the Vice-Chancellor, Professor Nick Smith, uh, members of council, it's lovely to see you here as well, uh, staff, students, Deb, lovely to see you again, Stephen's wife and his mother as well. A great pleasure to have you all with us this evening. 
It's a particular pleasure for me to propose a vote of thanks for our wonderful colleague, Aharangi Professor Stephen Marshall, who I am sure you agree with me, has just given an incredibly thought-provoking uh, inaugural lecture. What Stephen has done is cover some of the issues and challenges currently facing tertiary education, reflecting on how that will affect the future of the university, not just this university, not just New Zealand universities, but all universities. And I'm sure it escaped nobody in the audience the timeliness of what he has shared with us this evening. I strongly agree with Stephen that our universities are going through that once in a generation shift. As Stephen himself said in his presentation, there's different languages for this. The management consultants talk about disruption. I'm quite fond of transformation, uh, that question about innovation. But whatever you call it is quite clear that the accepted model for our sector no longer holds. Now, as an economic geographer, some of you might not know that, that, that is my background, uh, crisis is always followed by restructuring. Uh, for example, my doctoral research was on the telecommunications industry. When it was going through a similar period of, call it what you like, disruption, transformation, innovation. Now, if you think about that industry 30 years ago, you begin to understand that sectors sometimes are unrecognisable after both crisis and restructuring. Products change, organisations change, and indeed some disappear. Labour forces change, and who we serve, our customers, also change. Now, we're going through that period in our universities. There's a question about whether degrees will be the only or even the dominant product for the future. Stephen's been very, very clear about that. Universities are also being challenged by a whole raft of new organisations, both in learning and teaching and research. Our labour force, our people, are becoming much more heterogeneous, and our publics and our students are making new demands of us. So in all of this, Stephen's lecture is incredibly timely. Our challenge is to think about a university not just of the future, but to reiterate Stephen's closing point, for the future. Now, Stephen has showed us something of the questions that we will need to ask of ourselves if we are going to get this right, if we are going to do the mind shift that he has just asked us to do. And he has done it with consummate skill, knowledge and expertise. More generally, I hope you can all appreciate how incredibly privileged we are to have Stephen with us here at Taharanga Waka. He has led the Centre for Academic Development incredibly effectively, and it's lovely to see all of his colleagues who've turned out to support him this evening. Indeed, in our recent academic audit, it was the Centre for Academic Development that was singled out for the leadership that they provided this university uh, into, not just through the challenges of recent years, but into the world that we are now moving into. And you got just a, a, a snippet tonight of the extensive national and international experience and knowledge that Stephen has brought to this role. I do want to take the opportunity to say very personally, Stephen, how much I have learned from you. I have the incredible privilege of having the Centre for Academic Development in my portfolio, which is why I get to give the vote of thanks tonight. Normally it would be 
uh, a dean here. Stephen, you've done a terrific job. Uh, I have learned an incredible amount from you, and you are a colleague who I really value and will genuinely miss, so namihi nui. But more generally, it's a moment of celebration for all of us. Uh, as you will have gathered, a particularly uh, special moment for me in having the opportunity of offering that vote of thanks. Now, in a minute, I'm going to invite you all into the Hunter Common Room next door to share some refreshments. But first of all, let's once again show our gratitude and great celebration for Aharangi Professor Stephen Marshall. Well done, Stephen. <laughs>